What are the limits of learnability? We've probably all been in that situation where somebody's explaining a new idea or a new concept to us and we get it. We immediately understand what they mean. That light bulb goes off and we understand. Of course, we've probably all also been in the opposite situation where somebody's explaining something to us, maybe in the classroom, maybe at a job, and it doesn't make sense. Individually, the words that they're saying are all perfectly clear, but put together in that way, they don't convey meaning. What differentiates these two situations? How do we know when somebody is going to respond with understanding or when somebody is going to respond with confusion? How can we predict when a student is ready for a new idea? And as scientists, how do we even tackle this question? Well, learning at its fundamental level involves a change in how our brain processes the world. We have to somehow reconfigure our thinking to incorporate that new information and use it to inform our actions. So to understand the limits of learnability, we have to look inside the brain. We have to look under the hood to see what differentiates a brain that's ready to understand a new concept from a brain that is not ready to understand a new concept. But what kind of tasks should we study? There are a lot of things to be learned. We learn languages, we learn math, some of us learn how to flip bottles on tables. <laughs> well, to study the absolute limits of learnability, we should probably study the hardest thing that any of you have ever learned, and that is movement. Movement is, hands down, the hardest thing that you've ever had to learn. Walking upright on two feet is incredibly difficult. Has anybody here ever seen a two-legged stool? We are unstable, dynamical systems just waiting to topple over. The simple act of remaining upright requires constant monitored intervention by the nervous system. This, this is incredibly difficult. Doing it with your eyes closed, forget it. Very hard, don't try this at home. <laughs> this is why police use this maneuver to see if you've been drinking, because coordination of your movements is one of the first skills you lose when you're even mildly impaired. We know learning to control your movements is really hard because it takes us forever to get any good at it. The little girl in pink stripes right there is my daughter. I love her. She is the light of my life. But I will be completely honest with you. For the six months of her life, she was absolutely useless from a motor control perspective. She just flailed. Give a child a pile of Cheerios, and they will happily smash the Cheerios and mush them around and drop them on the floor for the dog to eat and occasionally grab them and miraculously get one into their mouth. And they'll play like this for hours. Why? Because the human hand is the most complex tool that you've ever had to learn how to use. It requires thousands upon thousands of hours to get good at using it. Most of play is actually just practicing motor skill. We know learning to control your movements is hard because we'll happily pay millions of dollars to those of us who have learned to control their bodies a little bit better than others of us for the sheer joy of watching them perform at that level. Some of us can learn to control our bodies with the same degree of precision and skill as professional athletes. Most of us can't. Why not? Finally, we know learning to control your movements is really hard because you engage more of your brain in the process of motor control than you do for anything else. At last count, there were more than a half a dozen brain areas, all of which are responsible for sending messages down your spinal cord to help you exert control over your muscles. The cerebellum, which is this fist-sized structure in the back of your head right here, contains more neurons in it than the rest of the brain combined, and its primary job is to help you coordinate and control your movements. Ironically, despite it taking more brain power than anything else, we hardly think about moving. In fact, motor control, most of us consider it trivial. I could walk and chew gum at the same time. We don't think about it until it goes wrong. Motor control disorders can, go, can occur for a number of reasons. Spinal cord injury affects 300,000 people in the United States and can result in complete paralysis below the level of the injury. Amputation 
There are roughly two million amputees in the United States caused by war, injury, or most commonly vascular disease due to diabetes. ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, affects 12,000 people in the United States and can cause complete paralysis. In all of these cases, the neural machinery that you've developed to control your movements exists. It's there in your head. You just lack the ability to control those intended actions and convert them into actual movements due to injured or missing tissue. There is a solution to this problem, and that's the brain-computer interface. This is Jan. At the time of this video, Jan had been unable to move for the past 10 years due to a rare neurological disorder. However, a team of researchers at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center implanted a set of electrodes into Jan's brain so that they could read from the brain areas responsible for controlling movement. And they're using that activity to control that robotic arm. Jan is modulating the activity of her brain to control the three-dimensional endpoint position of that arm, the 3D wrist orientation, as well as the grasp. And she's using that activity to feed herself for the first time in a decade. Naturally, the food of choice for this momentous occasion is chocolate. <laughs> Brain-computer interfaces have the potential to restore motor abilities to millions of people who have motor control disorders due to injury or disease. But brain-computer interfaces have to be learned. How do we know if a subject is going to be able to learn how to control a robotic arm? How do we know if they're going to be able to learn how to control a brain-controlled wheelchair? Well, we can use brain-computer interfaces to study this problem and to study the limits of learnability. And to help explain that, I'm going to talk a little bit about how these devices work. Your brain is composed of billions of cells called neurons. Now, neurons are electrically active. All of your ideas, your intentions, your thoughts are encoded in the electrical activity of these neurons. And when a researcher snuggles an electrode up next to one of these neurons, they can see the sparks of electricity that it emits as it communicates with the rest of the brain. You have roughly 100 billion neurons in your brain. Naturally, the activity of any individual neuron conveys only a limited amount of information about movement. So when researchers are driving a brain-computer interface, they typically implant silicon chips that can record from dozens to hundreds of neurons at the same time. That activity, noted here by the small blue lines, can be analyzed simultaneously and used to drive a brain-computer interface for control of a robotic arm, or as shown here, a cursor on a computer screen. Critically, a subject gets to see the activity that he produces so that he can modulate and change how he's operating his neural activity and hopefully learn how to control that brain-computer interface. Now, in order to drive this device, we have to understand and decode how motor intent is represented by these neurons. And it sounds like a complex process, but conceptually, it's rather straightforward. If you want to understand what the neural signal is for, say, moving to the left, what you do is you ask the subject to move to the left. And when the subject attempts to move to the left, what you'll notice is that certain neurons will upregulate the number of sparks of electricity that they make, the rate of those sparks, whereas others may go silent. You can then take that as a signal that those neurons are active when the subject wants that cursor to move to the left. And then the next time you see those neurons firing, you can use that to drive the cursor to the left. Similarly, if you want to understand the neural code for moving to the right, you can ask a subject to hit a target on the right. And you may see other neurons upregulate the rate at which they fire those sparks of electricity. And then you know when you see those neurons, that should be an indication of a desire to move right. And so when you see the action of those neurons fire, you can take that and use it to push the cursor to the right. A brain-computer interface hooked up in this way, 
is intuitive to control. So we call it an intuitive mapping between neural activity and cursor movement. It's intuitive because you use the neurons in much the way that they would naturally contribute to, say, an arm movement. Control of this kind of a brain-computer interface typically doesn't take much learning, at least for simple movements like controlling a cursor in two dimensions on a computer screen. Control of a complex, high degree of freedom robotic arm is another story. But for this case, the control of the 2D cursor is relatively straightforward, and you can see that because the subject can make straight, simple, relatively fast movements to any target that they want to hit. But if you want to study the limits of learnability, you don't have to hook it up in this straightforward, intuitive way. Instead, you can do something crazy, like scramble the relationship between the neurons and the movements. Now, as soon as you do that, the subject will lose the ability to control the cursor. And so, when he intends to hit certain targets, the cursor may go in the wrong direction or may just drift off in a random direction. And the question is, can the subject learn to reconfigure their neural activity, to regain control of the cursor through this arbitrarily scrambled mapping? That's the learnability question in a nutshell. We've given the subject something that they have to understand, a new device that they have to conceptualize, reconfigure their thinking, and reorganize their neural activity in order to gain control. If they're able to do this in a relatively short time span, say an hour, we would call that mapping learnable. If they're not able to do this over that course of a couple of hours of practice, we would call that mapping unlearnable. And the question is, can we look at neural activity and determine whether a brain is capable of learning a new mapping or is not capable of learning a new mapping? Can we predict, before we even ask the subject to use that mapping, whether or not that brain is able to learn it? And the answer is that we can. So how do we do this? Imagine a space where the action of every neuron is an axis in this space. The number of sparks that neuron one will emit will be one axis on the space, and the rate at which neuron two produces sparks will be another axis in the space, and neuron three will be another, and so on and so forth. We can map the simultaneous action of neurons in this space by plotting it as a point in this space that represents at every instance in time how many sparks of electricity every neuron was making. And we can do this for another instance in time and build another point in this space. And we can observe a brain over the course of five or 10 minutes and build up a repertoire of a list of all those neural activity patterns that we see. And one of the fundamental things that we find is that neural activity doesn't fill the space. Each of us has a repertoire of neural activity that we produce, certain patterns of neural activity that our brains produce naturally, and certain patterns of neural activity that never occur. Now, an intuitive mapping or to control the BCI involves producing neural activity patterns to make one movement to the left, or producing different neural activities to make a different movement, say, to the right. And it looks like essentially an axis, a line that points through this space, where to produce movements to the left, you may produce colors on the left. And to produce movements to the right, you may produce neural activity patterns that live on the right-hand side of this screen. When we scramble the mapping, it gives somebody something new to learn. It involves swinging this axis, spinning it in space randomly. Now, it turns out, if this line is well spanned by your neural repertoire, you can reconfigure how those neural activity patterns relate to movement, so that you end up producing now neural activity patterns towards the bottom in order to move right. And you end up producing neural activity patterns towards the top of your repertoire in order to move left. It turns out you can reassociate your neural activity patterns with arbitrary motor outcomes relatively quickly. Now, there are other mappings, other scramblings between neural activity and cursor movements that you can make. And 
So that first one, we would call it learnable. But we could give the subject another mapping to use, and that would spin this line randomly in space. And in this case, it might point outside of the set of patterns that you're able to produce, your neural repertoire. And it turns out you can attempt to reconfigure these patterns and spin them around. And it doesn't matter how you reconfigure those patterns. You can never drive movements through this device. They don't, in order to make movements through this device, you would have to generate fundamentally new activity patterns outside of your repertoire. And it turns out these kinds of movements are not learnable. So let's recap. We'd like to understand the difference between something that is learnable quickly and something that is not. And so to study this, we tackled the hardest thing that you ever try to learn, and that's movement. And we leverage brain-computer interfaces, right, which are devices that have the potential to restore motor control ability to those who've lost it due to injury or disease. And these devices have to be learned. Now, these devices also represent really powerful scientific tools because they give us a lot of flexibility in designing mappings between neural activity and cursor movements and asking subjects, can you produce particular patterns of neural activity? Can you learn how to control this device? And how do you go about that process? And what we found is that everybody has a neural repertoire, a set of neural activity patterns that they're able to produce. And fast learning occurs by reassociating those patterns with arbitrary motor outcomes. But things that are really hard to learn necessitate the generation of neural activity patterns outside of that repertoire. So what's next? What we really want to do is make the unlearnable learnable. How do you expand your neural repertoire? How can we design a training environment in order to accelerate that learning process? If we were able to do this, it would have massive implications for motor rehabilitation or training subjects to learn brain-computer interfaces. But are these ideas more broadly applicable? Can we accelerate learning in the classroom? Can we train all of us to become professional athletes? I don't know. <laughs> it's outside of my neural repertoire. But I'm working on it. When I find out, I will let you know. Thank you all very much.